subversive orthodoxy. You heard from Angelus the necessity of that for the survival and evolution of community and ourselves. And so Larry's going to help us think about in a way that comes from his work what, what that is yeah. and, and to tell a story and then we get to play with that story. Um, the uh, task falls upon me to explain subversive orthodoxy uh, because I use that as a title to this book that I wrote about 20th century figures who had the courage of their strangeness and gave back to their communities by being nonconformists and following a different path. And Ward took the title of that and turned it into a whole mythology. <laughs> and so now subversive orthodoxy is not just the name that I gave to I don't know, 10 or 15, 20th century uh, heroes, but it's also, thanks to war, the name for an entire paradoxical relationship to community where, where the very thing that makes you valuable is your strangeness and your willingness to share that. And he's been modeling it for years. Yeah. <laughs> And so we were talking about, about you know, how best to talk about this. And, and in my book, I have, I have, so, I have models of great uh, subversive orthodox people of the 20th century because it turns out the 20th century is the century of subversive orthodox. Uh, and, and basically by that, I mean that people that come out of great traditions but carry those traditions into the 20th century in unique and unexpected ways. For example, probably the most, most famous or one that, that we would know about here at Mount Madonna is, is Gandhi using the Bhagavad Gita as a tool for political revolution. He's got a chapter in my book and one of the quotes from one of his followers um, summarizes a little bit of, of uh, subversive orthodoxy when they, they asked one of his followers what it was about Gandhi that made him a more attractive leader than the socialist alternative who were, who were more politically connected and had greater military threat. And his followers said, well, he's given us a way of fighting without becoming like our enemy. And, and I, I'm sure Angelus is going to talk about this uh, projection and how do you stand for what you stand for without making an enemy of the person that is, is uh, causing you difficulty. But the, the, the one that, that I wanted to talk about today, because I think he's, his story is, is more fun and we, and we want to have fun in the afternoon. And it is, uh, yes, and it's the most outrageous in some ways, is Lech Wałęsa of the Polish Solidarity Movement. And he became uh, president of Poland and uh, of the first uh, non-communist government in Poland and essentially was the architect of the end of Soviet domination in Eastern Europe. Now, what makes him so interesting um, is that uh, Lech Wałęsa, in nobody's imagination, had the authority to become leader of solidarity or president of Poland. In fact, he, he had a ninth grade education. And he was an uh, electrician. And so his, his training was, was entirely vocational, entirely sort of, he worked at the Gdansk shipyards as an electrician. And he really didn't have uh, much political sophistication, except for the fact that he knew when he was getting screwed. And this turns out to be an incredibly important trait for the group, to have somebody who is willing to say, we are getting screwed, and I am willing to fight for it. Now, the, this is the way he, I, I love this story because this is the way Lech Wałęsa got elected to uh, 
president of the Solidarity Union. He was, um, they had a, um, a meeting, like they had millions of meetings, where the communist management of the Gdansk shipyards were at a little table. And then they had representatives of the union from the various shops sitting at another table across from them. And so Walesa was, what, 28-year-old electrician representing the electricians, right? And so the, the, uh, they start the usual song and dance about, you know, we would really like to give you increased salaries, but, you know, this is, we've got to cut back. And the West is putting all this pressure on us, and uh, you're just falling into the hands of the Western agitators. And don't you see you really, you know, for the good of the country, should really not press us for increased wages. At which point, uh, Valesa says, I have something to say. And they said, Leck, wait, what do you have to say? He says, I don't mind when you lie to me in the newspapers. I'm, I accept that. And I don't mind when you lie to me on television, because you control the television. But you don't lie to me to my face. And he leaps across. This is funny. I don't know where I'm crying. He leaps across the table and tries to hit the guy in the mouth, which is not very Gandhi-esque. And they pull him off, and he's, you know, don't lie to me. And everybody in the room said, that's our next president. And it wasn't because he was sophisticated. It was because he had something that that room needed. Now, after he, after he got elected president, this is, this is another funny thing. The head of the, um, uh, the head economist of the Solidarity Movement came to him and said, Leck, you know, you got a ninth grade education, you're an electrician. I think maybe you should step down and let one of us who know how to handle politics take over the Solidarity. And uh, Valesa says, uh, well, you never helped us for the past 20 years. Why should I trust you to help us now? And they, they said, well, because you don't know anything. And he goes, well, I'm president of the union. <laughs> so they said, well, what's your plan? And he says, well, I'm, I'll figure it out. So his plan, and he was a very religious guy, which is another thing that, sh which is a lot of these plebeian uh, figures or these subversive orthodoxies like Gandhi have their connection with indigenous traditions and orthodox mm -hmm. traditions. And so he would, he would go to negotiation meetings and, he, and then when there was a break, the communists would go to strategy meetings and Valesa would go to church. Mm -hmm. And he would meditate and pray for the 30 minutes that they were having the strategy meeting. And then he'd come back with these cockamamie ideas that he got when he was praying. That, that they didn't know how to deal with. And so he, the, his friend told him, he says, Leck, you know, you're gonna need, you're gonna need something, a plan, something. Because you can't just be, you know, ad-libbing it after what the Virgin Mary tells you to do, you know? <laughs> and he says, okay, well, how about this? I'm not gonna give in, uh, I'm not gonna sign any contract until we get a 6% pay increase across the board. And they said, that you'll never get a 6% pay increase. He goes, well, OK, that's good negotiation. Then I'll just hang in there. <laughs> so day in, day out, they're negotiating. And Melissa is just 6%. He said, you got 6% here? And we can't go that high. Like, you know, we're going to do this. Meanwhile, every other union in the country is going out on strike in solidarity with the, with the uh, 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 ship uh, builder, uh, ship union. So the entire country has been shut down because Walesa's holding to the 6%. So the head of the communists figures it out. He says, you know, this guy, he's been telling us all along, he only wants 6%. If we can just break Solidarity Union, give the guy 6%. You know, it's no big deal. We'll co-opt him. We'll take back the country. The communists will be more... So Melissa goes into the meeting after lunch, and uh, the communist guy says, Leck, you're a tough bargainer. 
you know, you're really tough. We're going to give you the 6%. And he says, okay, well, that's everybody at the shipyard? And he says, yeah, everybody at the shipyard gets 6%. And so he goes, victory. So he goes out, and the, the, everybody, the whole country is sort of watching this. And they're like on, you know, fences. And they're, you know, what, was the, what was the result of the negotiation? So Valesa comes out, you know, he's like, <laughs> victory, victory. He says, well, what, what was the deal? What was the deal? And he goes, 6% across the board, 6%. And the um, crowd says, 6%. We had a revolution. We were going to overthrow the government. And you sold out the revolution for a 6% pay increase? And Walesa says, uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, I mean, that was my plan, 6%. six percent. And then the boos. Boo, traitor. Well, that's a traitor. And so he's looking around, and they're going, boo, you know, you've just, did you sign it? And he goes, yeah, I signed the agreement. And he goes, yeah, boo, boo. And then he had, he had one of those great plebeian or um, subversive orthodox moments. He says, and, and this is something that somebody without a, that, that had more than a ninth grade education probably wouldn't have done. He said, I made a mistake, I blew it, rips up the contract, the strike is on, uh, we're, we're going to continue to strike until there's a revolution in the country, I'm sorry, I blew it. And then everybody's, well, that's a hero. <laughs> So then they, they fire him from the, the uh, shipyard, so he can't officially be a union representative because he's no longer working for the, for the shipyard. And so the, day when the, the next day when they were sh shutting down the, the plant again for a, 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 a nationwide strike, he leaps over the fence, and they make him an honorary member of the union. <laughs> And ultimately, they shut down the government, and he becomes president and makes a 1,001 mistakes. But he, he was able to do something that nobody else could do. And it was his moment, and it was his time and his place. And you know, the, the authenticity of his anger was something that the intellectuals couldn't have provided. He didn't even talk properly, did he? Oh, and that's the other thing. You wanted me to mention this. When he became president, a lot of people in Poland were upset because in his public address, addresses, he would use four-letter words. <laughs> and they said it's very embarrassing to Poland to have a, a president who's saying those are not going to screw us around anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And, and yeah, yeah, he is, you know, now he's a 20th century icon. Now, he's had his problems since then. But, but that's, that's the way the, the people's revolution moves. Um, one, other, one other thing, and we'll, we'll get back to our question, but uh, Elie Wiesel, who was um, also in my book, uh, uh, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, wrote Night. He was a concentration camp survivor. And he said that if you, wanted to understand, if you want to understand the tw uh, 20th century in, in politics and our current state of why we have to be subversive orthodox, not subversives, they're a dime a dozen, not orthodox, we got enough conformists to keep the trains running on time. But the, but the people that bring their uniqueness and, and nonconformity to the table, rather than just hide it away in a in a blog uh, for deviants or something. I don't know. Uh, so anyway, he, <laughs> plenty uh, of those. <laughs> although those are good too. I uh, but the um, he said he said what happened with with Western civilization was about 250 years ago. Western man uh, made a deal with God and said to God. Uh, God, I don't really understand you. I don't really know you, what your plan is for the universe. Could you let me be God for one second, just so that I can understand, you know, what you're going through? And God said, uh, 
well, you know, I, I would do that, except once I make you God, there's no guarantee that you'll switch back because you'll be the guy that's in control and I'll be on the outs. And so the um, uh, man said, no, I promise, I promise. This is just instrumental. I just am doing this as kind of like an experiment to find out, you know, what you're experiencing, and I promise you that I will switch back immediately once I, I have that insight. So God, in his stupidity, said... Uh, Gave him the dime bag. Okay, let's, let's make the trade. So they made the trade around 1732 or something. And, man, and Western man never trades back. And since that time... God has become man, and man has become God. And he says, and over the last 50 years or so, at least since World War II, both sides are getting uncomfortable with the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and we're getting ready to negotiate a new deal. We're tired of being gods, and he's tired of being the suffering humanity. And, and, the, and since we started with a rabbi and ended with a Holocaust survivor, I'll, I'll end my little presentation with Kafka, because <laughs> Kafka's another great um, subversive orthodox, because here's a guy who's writing works that may never get published in a tradition that seems to be disappearing. And what keeps him going, right? And so there's this little book called uh, Conversations with Kafka written by a student, 18 years old, visits Kafka on Fridays because his dad works with him in the insurance company. And after Kafka became famous, he wrote his memories of all these conversations he had with Kafka. And of course, the academics find this a dubious document because how could anybody remember word for word. But you read these conversations and you think, my God, that's God. And so there's one, and I'll end with this because I think this is really great um, uh, description of our current, why we have to be subversive orthodox. Well, not we have to be, why we are subversive orthodox. Uh, there's a, a communist rally taking place outside of Kafka's office at the uh, accident insurance company. And the student says to Kafka, uh, you're a critic of the modern world. Why aren't you out there with the communists uh, agitating for revolution? And Kafka says to him, that's, that's the problem with the modern world. Everything goes by false names. They call themselves revolutionaries. They're really totalitarians. The capitalists call themselves free marketers. They're really monopolists. They say, I have a great job here working for the accident insurance company. It's a form of penal servitude. Tonight, I'm going to go home to my apartment, have dinner and do a little writing. No, tonight I'm going to go home to my prison cell, lock myself in, and try to find my soul. Now, how many false names do we give to what we do? I mean, how many heroic actions do we call? on heroic deeds. And it just takes somebody like Kafka to redescribe it for us. Or Lech Walesa who says, you don't have to take the bull. Uh, and then we all recognize it. And it's like, you know, they don't have to be our leader. They, they could even be badly dressed. They just have to be in the community, right? <laughs> and once they say it, we say, damn, he's right on that one. <laughs> I, I really don't like his use of language, but you know, he, knows, he knows what's going on politically. So that's, that's my version of, of subversive orthodoxy. And I think uh, Vivian has a question about our, our subversive orthodoxy. That... Oh my God, that was so good. After cookies and dancing, that was just like hit the spot. So... 
What we're thinking of doing now is getting into some small groups and exploring with one another what is that wild hair in you that needs to speak truth to power, whatever it is, however small. And I'd love for you to add to the question, but the question we're thinking of is what feels subversive. Yeah, yes. The, um, that is being called for. That you are a little bit hesitant to, to contribute because it seems too strange. Like, let's have a war and not kill anybody. <laughs> let's have a revolution and have it based on love and, you know. I mean, these, um, or, or Martin Luther King's another character in my book, and, and his great innovation was let's love Jesus and, and not be. I, white supremacists. <laughs> so in the spirit of my so-called democratic facilitation style, which is really totalitarian, <laughs> who would like a minute to, to just like a minute or two of journaling before you get into a small group to answer this question? Just so you know. It is a totalitarian facilitation style. Yeah. Let's take a couple of minutes with some, and Devin, I see you would provide us some background music. What in you feel subversive that you feel a little uncomfortable about bringing forward in your community? <laughs> <laughs> 